Good evening. I'm Nick Bonner. This is Travis Vickerson. Good evening. We're uh, we're here tonight to do crane setup fundamentals training. We're going to talk about yeah. some problem picks. Some yeah, we're going to look for. We're going to talk about major differences between our knuckle boom cranes, which we have over here to the right, and our load line cranes. We're going to see that's the big thing in the market now. Is we're starting to see more and more of this come in the market. We got to make sure we understand how to set them up correctly. Awesome. Well, it'll be interesting to explore those differences. Uh, we've got Carson Royer on the sticks. Uh, he'll be managing our production booth today, so if you've got questions, send those in. He's there. I think all he does is read them, and the rest just is automatic. So uh, talk to him. Uh, he'll talk to us. He's in my ear on the Cena. Wonderful. And, uh, Travis is going to be working with our crane operator. Uh, he'll introduce them. We've also got a climber here, yep. local from Durham. So big thanks to all those people. And uh, I'm going to go grab the mobile camera, and uh, we'll Sounds let him great. go. Did I miss anything, Carson? No. Nope. All right. All Travis, right. take it away. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, buddy. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it is extremely humid here in uh, Apex, North Carolina. It's like 96 degrees and ridiculous humidity. So my glasses are fogging up, but we're going to get through this. First of all, I want to thank TreeStuff.com for letting this happen. Um, this has been an idea that Nick and Carson and I have been working on for a while. And we know we're seeing more and more cranes in the industry now. We're seeing more knuckle booms or like with mech saws. We're seeing more load line cranes like this Alltech machine behind me. They're designed specifically for tree work. So cranes are a big deal. It's a big change. And we have to understand how that change is going to affect things. We got to understand setups. We got to understand load charts. How do we tie into the crane? How do we use the crane to the best of its ability? Also want to thank um, the Tree Care Industry Association, TCIA, for helping write the Crane Operations Specialist Manual and the Crane Operations Specialist Workbook. Uh, it's helping co-author those. They've been great. If you don't have one, please, they look like this right here. Let me go grab it real quick. All right. Definitely make sure you get There's a lot of great information in these manuals. You know, on those rainy days, we got nothing else going on in the office. You can get this one here. You also can get the certificate of completion from this one. All right. It's another Tree Care Academy. And, of course, we always have the Z133. We always have to be mindful of this. All right. This is our safety Bible. This tells us what we can and can't do safely. And we're going to talk about some of the things this manual talks about. But first of all, let's talk about our main differences here. We have a knuckle boom here on the left from CS Tree Service. All right. It's a Powell Finger machine. It's got a mech saw on it right now with a current setup. All right. It's good for 1320. All right. That's 1320 pounds. That's what it's good for. We have a 900 pound mech head on there. So we have to deduct that weight. We can't just pick 1320 pounds with that kind of head. So we have to do the math sometimes with trains. All right. But we can only pick is what we're stable enough to pick. All right, that was the big thing when we had this set up on this location here. We're going to work on a sweet gun behind me over the barn. We had some really hilly terrain. You can see we ended up having to come in, shore up underneath the tires in the back. We had to put outrigger pads down, of course. All right, the, the biggest difference we're going to have here is these aren't outriggers. This is a knuckle boom. These are stabilizers. Over here we have outriggers. Biggest difference is we're transferring our load from our tie-in on the crane ball all the way down our outrigger to our foundation. All right. Here we have stabilizers. You have to have the wheels on the ground with this machine. All right. That's where it gets its strength from is in its chassis. It transfers that load of the chassis through the tires and onto the ground. Our stabilizers are just that. They're here to stabilize our machine. All right. So as you can see here on this front tire, we end up having to build a ramp situation to get the elevation high enough. All right. And hopefully Nick can show, maybe pan down for this and just kind of show what we had to do. We had to work up to this. All right. We're in the main part of the tires. We've captured the load correctly. We've stabilized it with stabilizers, but it took some work to get the setup correct. All right. Big difference is this machine, we're allowed to get within five degrees of level, whereas that machine over there, we have to stay at 1% of level. All right. One degree of level, not 1%, sorry, one degree of level. So it's very different machines. All right. Other differences, this is a rear mount machine. This is also a rear mount machine. Okay. Benefit of the knuckle boom is you can unfold the crane, punch through your canopy, and go to work. Here, we've got to come out of cradle and swing around. You may have some clearance issues. You've got to be careful of power, overhead power lines. All right? So we start looking at our setups. Really, when it gets fundamental when it comes to our load line cranes that are on outriggers. All right? We have to actually look at what our machine weighs. All right? And then we have to divide that by our number of outriggers. That gives us a starting point. This is something that's being missed gravely in our industry. We're setting up on soils. We're not setting up on construction sites. And we're failing through the soil and we end up flipping cranes. All right. We did the math earlier already. With this current setup, we are translating 54 pounds per square inch to the soil. 
right here we're on gravel, solid compact gravel, is good for 78 PSI, okay? So that's 78 PSI that we've translated down with 54. Now, if I take this exact same setup here with 54 PSI, it's not gonna be good on my clay. Here in North Carolina, we deal with a lot of clay. Clay's only good for 33 PSI. So what do I need to do? I've gotta get bigger, all right? And that's where we're seeing bigger problems occurring with crane work, is we're not putting enough dunnage, which is the material here, any type of wood material is called dunnage. We're not getting enough dunnage down to get that dispersion of soil out, so we're not failing things over, all right? We have here is a standard crib setup, all right, all ends are touching together, so we call that blocking, all right? If our cribbing wasn't touching, then it becomes cribbing at that point, and you end up overcrossed like this, all right? And then if we run around a rod through here, we end up with matting. So those are our three basic forms of support for outriggers. On top of all that, we've got an outrigger pad, so we can capture the maximum amount from our plate here to our outrigger pad, to our support material, to our soil. That's how we're translating that to the 54 PSI. All right. Now we figured that off of a max capacity pick over top of one outrigger. So we took machine weight, divide it by five outriggers, take max capacity pick. Now we understand this is a 38 ton machine. We're not going to be picking 38 tons. I understand that. The best thing you can do though on your job site is figure out what your max pick is going to be. All right. And do that plus 125% of it. So you have a maximum capability of load moment. All right. So you really want to engineer your, your outrigger support to really give you what you want. Because we know if my operator Chris here goes to make a pick and I don't have the support here and I start failing it down and I lose that one degree of level, now I'm side loading my boom. I'm pulling on things over this way. I could fail through. I could punch through soil. And we start having big problems. That's when we have cranes go over. We're seeing more and more cranes flip over in this industry. I truly believe it all comes back to right here, all right? All of our failures are coming from poor setups. You add a poor setup, you add a pick that you don't know the weight on, or dynamic load, and it all goes downhill from there. So we have to start the foundation correctly. But again, as you can see, vast difference from what we have on the stabilizer here with just an outrigger pad to what we've had to put over here for an outrigger setup. So don't be confused when you're dealing with a knuckle boom that has stabilizers versus a load line crane that's gonna have outriggers. All right, so we really have to be attentive to that. All right. Also, we're gonna look at is we call setback. We don't have any of that here today in the yard we're in, but say we had an underground culvert right here, or maybe a septic tank, all right? Well, how far back do we need to be from where our outrigger's at to our underground buried object? Well, if you know the depth, it's very simple. It's one and a half times the known depth. So if we have a foundation wall of a building that's four feet down, we need to be six feet out. Reason being is as we compress the soil down, we compress it radially. All of it's forcing out. Well, as these fingers of radiation push out, they're gonna compact with that underground structure unequally. And then they're gonna load in together and you can fail walls. You can fail vault boxes, sewage systems. All of those go into it, okay? So that's one of the things we said back. But what if we don't know the depth? Hmm, oh, there's somewhere in this yard, maybe there's a septic tank, maybe there's old gas tank, but I don't know how deep it is. All right, so we play it safe. We take our widest part of our outrigger support times four, and that's how far we set up from that spot. Okay, and this is just a starting point, all right? If you're in soil that you think, mm, this is a really grassy backyard, maybe it's really soft, it's rained a lot, we might need to double that and go eight times, all right? But that's a starting point. I know we talk about things called the rule of three and rule of five when it comes to outrigger support. All that says is I take the size of my outrigger pad times three, okay? And that gives me a base knowledge. What we found in testing is that's not good enough. That's good enough on construction sites when you have engineered soils, you have compact gravels, but when you're setting up on sides of highways, customer side yards, even potentially customers' driveways with small concrete, that's not good enough. Rule of three doesn't cut it for us. We've got to get bigger. So that's where we're starting at. Now, you can see a different setups. Well, we have a single stack here. Up front, we have a multi-stack. And if we'll come up here, we even had to put a riser in because we had a gradient going in two different directions. So we ended up having to put a riser beam in down here to level the first stack, all right? Underneath that riser, we have additionals, all right? So we're not having any gaps. Because these are not touching here, we call that cribbing, all right? 
where they're touching is blocking. So we ended up with a three, a two level with a riser because we had this drainage here. We had to engineer for that, all right? So it took some time and setup, all right? But those are all things you have to come into. You can use wedges. You can use synthetic material. They make a lot of matting now. Notch has got these great outrigger pads. They also have great matting available as well. So we've all seen the big mats that are out there. You can get them in red now as well, just like this, and use those, all right? All right. But let's move on, all right? So hopefully we have some good people watching at this point. Maybe we got any questions yet, by chance, on anything we talked about with setup before we move past setup? Any questions, Nick? There's no questions right now. Wonderful. People, people actually, I know, they want to know about the iron. Can you like... The iron? Yeah, they want to they know how much it can lift. They want to know how tall the stick is. How much Everybody is. cares about the numbers. Everybody loves the iron. Just Everybody like, loves the irons. About the equipment that we're working with here before we go any of course. So this is an Alltech 38 ton machine, okay? We've got 108 foot of main boom out right now, all right? At this capacity, what are you good for right now, Chris? 12,000 He's good for 12,000 pounds in his current configuration, all right? Now, we are on full outriggers. This machine has the capability to even do mid-span outriggers. So in tight setups, we can even come to here. And our con configuration changes, so therefore, load chart's gonna be up top. It's gonna be kind of hard for you to see, but he might be able to pass one down to you. There it is right there, look at that. It's a multi-stage load chart. So as you can see, you've got different settings, that's all those metals there, for different types of configurations. All right, this is full outrigger configuration we're on. On the right hand side here, you can see what our working area is. This is a 360 capability. So we have a 360 spin, all right? He has the option to put an extendable jib on. We don't have a jib on, but he has the option for a jib on the screen, all right? What's really nice about this Alltech machine is it's a swing cab. So as he goes up, the cab's gonna rotate with him. For operators, that really helps the neck. At the end of the day, you're not having to crane your neck back. It's nice, it also has AC. Don't have it on right now because it's a little loud. How far can it reach out? He has 108 foot of main boom. Right. So he's got 108 so foot. Side reach? 27. 27 side reach because of counterweighting and all that. 27 feet. Yeah. And what's it good for 27 feet? What's your low chart 27 feet flat? I'm gonna wipe my glasses real quick because I'm fogging up here. It's just so hot. What do you got there, Chris? Oh, flat out with what? 108 foot of boom? Yeah, 108 foot. We've got uh, 14 flat out. Yep. Flat out. Lay me down. Nothing. 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 So, how did we go from 12,000 like we are right now to nothing? Well, a crane is no more than a giant lever. That's all a crane is. All right? It's like a giant fishing pole when you had it as a kid. The longer you are and the flatter you get, the more load it takes back here to counterweight that. All right, this machine doesn't have external counterweights like some machines do, but very, very few load line cranes like this are gonna give you that luxury to lay flat out and grab something. Now this machine, on the other hand, has that capability. If we'll come back here to this load chart, you wanna come take a walk with me there, Mr. Nick? This Palfinger machine here in current configuration, as it is right now, without the mech head on there, we need to take the mech head off, we're good flat out at 84 feet, and we're good for 1320, flat, all right? Where our load line crane can't do that. That's the benefit of a knuckle boom. It has some advantages. And as you can see, as we work back to a better angle, we gain, all right? Close right in, we're good for 18,400, fully, com fully compressed, all right? So it has great capabilities, but you have to understand the differences in the machines. If you're having to go straight in something, this is definitely gonna be a better chart for you versus that, which is gonna be up and over material, all right? Load line cranes work up and over material, suspended below them on a load line. Knuckle booms work at the material, all right? One thing that's getting ready to change here, and I've had a lot of questions about this recently, talking about operators, is November 18th, 2018, OSHA has a hard set deadline. For anybody operating a crane, is required to be a certified operator, all right, through an accredited company. There's four accredited companies in the United States, all right? Myself and Chris, we're both NICER qualified. That's our, that's our credentials through NICER, all right? But people go, oh. Now, in OSHA, it says, I don't have to have a crane operator's license if I'm only picking up raw organic material. Hmm. So as long as I'm only picking up trees that have not been processed yet, I don't have to have a license per November 18th. But what happens if you put somebody on the ball? 
you have to fly climber on the ball, and we're going to talk about here in a little while how to do that. You are now no longer picking up raw organic material. By OSHA, you have to have a license to do that. Or say you go pick up that stump grinder because it won't th fit through the fence, and you want to carry it to the backyard of the property you're working on, you now have to have a license to do that. All right? So that's a big thing that's changing. A lot of guys don't agree with it. A lot of girls don't agree with it. But it is the, w the world we live in right now. All right? So that's a huge push. I personally work at a company called Cranes 101. If you're interested in operator training, please contact me or contact Cranes 101. We would love to help you out with that. All right? We can do that. I actually did Chris's company a few months back, came to his property, came to his site, and we took care of that right here with his machines. All right? So now we got the crane set up. We're up in the air. What are we going to be picking, though? So let's talk about what we're going to be picking. Behind me here, we've got this nice sweet gum back here. All right, and you can see my blue laser. All right, we've got a big stem that comes off over our barn here that we're going to be taking off. All right, we know we've had a lot of rain here recently, so we know our pick's going to be heavy. All right, I've got this wonderful app on my phone that does this for me. It's called Logweight Pro. All right, we go to Logweight Pro, it is free. It's got all my different species in here. All right, so we're going to go sweet gum. There's our sweet gum. We're going to go 18 inches DBH. The biggest downside is this app only works in inches. Okay, so I can't get footage. So we have to do a little bit of math with it. All right, but we can figure out where we're going to be at based on that. So let's go to a 10 foot log. So 120 inches. Scroll on down here. Do 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 do. My finger doesn't move quite fast enough. Eh, we're getting there. We're in the 200s. We're moving on down the road. 160s, 140s, 30s, and we're there. All right. We know we're at 1,016 pounds. All right. Now, that's pretty good, but what about water weight? What about foliage? It's really interesting what we're seeing is uh, there was a theory long, long time ago by Leonardo da Vinci. All right. It's called similarity in nature. What it states is a tree that is eight inches that goes up and splits into branches, the the sum of those two together cannot equal more than the parent branch. All right? That was his theory way back when. We know it holds true. All right? We know that a tree can't support structure bigger than it is below it. All right? So as you go up, if I've got an 18-inch branch down bottom, I can't possibly have more than 18 inches on the next set of parent branches above that. All right? The tree can't support that kind of growth. It would just fall apart. So it might split into two, a 9-inch and a 9-inch. Maybe it splits into a eight inch and a 10 inch, maybe a 12 inch and a six inch. But either way, we know the sum can't be more than our parent branch. So that helps with our math because I always get that question of, well, that's great. Your log weight app shows me how many inches the 18 inch pieces, but it changes as we go up the tree. It was 18 inches down here, but it's six inches up here. I understand that. But we know from a certain distance to a certain distance, it can't get any bigger than where we're at. So we can use that. So we did it on a 10 foot section, so I know at 10 foot it's 1,000, so 10 foot of another is 2,000, and so forth on up. And that's how we're able to get a relatively accurate, and it is a guess, I'm not going to lie about this, it is a guess, but it's an educated guess based on the material we have, the data we're using, and experience. All right? Chris and I were talking about it earlier about taking bets on what these things weigh because we do that all the time as operators and climbers. We wonder, hey, I bet this thing weighs about 15, maybe 1,600 pounds. Oh, no, it's 1,800. Let me go from there. You have a question. Ask people to hit the heart button if they like the knuckle boom better or the thumbs up. Oh, we got, we got a comparison. So, what I need right now a little bit of community activism here, right? Hearts for knuckles, thumbs up for load lines. Where do you live? Hearts, a little this down over here, a little bit of this action. You let us know. I know where I stand. I'm, I'm over in this world. I like these. Better than these. This is where I'm comfortable at. It's where I learned at. I started on load line cranes. All right. I'm still relatively new to knuckle booms. All right. We've also been asked that if I'm asking, because evidently there's not enough people watching me right now, because I want more people watching me, to please share this. Because somebody might be sitting at home right now going, man, it's Tuesday night. I ain't got nothing to do. I could watch a webinar, but they're not. Instead, maybe they're watching Ballers on HBO. Two free CUs for the quiz. The quiz comes right out of TCIA's Crane Operations Specialist Manual. All right, comes right out of there. So if you got that manual, it might help you out a little bit. 
All right? Just saying. If you don't have it, you should ask yourself why you don't have it. All right? So let's get back to our sweet gum. What we've decided is we're going to make this as one single pick. We're going to take one pick. We're going to put a three-point attachment. We're going to put an attachment here. We're going to put an attachment here. And we're going to put an attachment here using our slings here. The sling kit we're using here is the Tufelberger Mark Chisholm crane kit. Yes, the legend himself, Mark Chisholm's crane kit. All right, three independent slings. You've got two at a set length. And then you've got one blue one that's nice and long. All right. And I get asked a lot of times, well, how are you attaching these? They don't have a dead eye, and it's a dead eye sling. So how are you attaching this? Well, you have different ways you can attach it. All right. Oh, we have a stop. Hold on. Pause. Okay, right on. We don't have, I thought we had a question. I was hoping for a question. I want a question badly. All right. So what we can do with this, we can very easily come in here, do a closed clove. All right. For small material, that's completely acceptable to pull with. The app, it is log weight. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, hold on, my phone locked up on me. Log weight pro is the name of the app. Just type in log weight pro, all one word. It's free. You can download it right now. Thanks, Travis. All right. So that's one way to attach it. All right. You can do a cow hitch on it. You can even do a running bowling if you need to. All right. So there's different ways to attach this. I've yet to find a way where I can't attach this being the way it is. Now I will tell you, when you first get these slings, they are very stiff. They're not very pliable, they're hard to work with. Hang with them, all right? Make a few picks, and they really start to get where they need to be. The reason is, is they have a coating on them, all right? And that coating helps them keep from being picked, all right? Especially when you're dealing with pines. So that coating on this DuraBraid line is what's causing that stiffness at first. But it's gonna wear in, it's gonna get comfortable. Within six months, absolutely love it. Right. So up here, on this dead eye sling, you can see we got our splice here. Our berry is a tapered berry, comes all the way to about here, all right? Comes up, splits off. We have nice chafe, slings on, chafe sleeves on here for our hook. This part goes in the hook. Unlike other crane industries, tree industry requires that your gate be pinned shut. Once your slings are in, the, are in the throat of the hook, that's it. There is no more open this up, putting this back. The reason being is, and I've seen this happen, if they're not pinned, and as you're moving this thing around, it ends up over here, you go to make your pick, you actually can end up easily dynamically opening that. All right? That's a bad day, especially if you get this thing all the way open to the point where this is going to fall out. Because then you think your climber makes his cut. I got it. I'm lifting up. I don't got it. All I got is a dead sling. All right? So make sure you're always pinning this in. All right? You can use a, a pin like that. You can use a bolt. But do some type of positive locking mechanism here. All right? Got our overhaul ball here. All right? Above our overhaul ball, we have our crane tie-in. All right, this is the ANSI crane tie-in. It's a redundant system. Two completely redundant slings girthed up here. The two steel slings here. If my climber will come over here, we're gonna show kind of different attachments for this real quick. You ready? Yes, come on over. He was just getting his gear on, getting all suited up. All right, this here is Steven. Oh. They want to see some cutting. We're going to make some, we're going to get some cutting going. Tell them we're going to do cutting again. We are going to cut and we're going to remove a giant piece out of this sweet gum in one pick. Robert, and then Robert Golden has a question. All right, Robert, shoot. Robert Golden would like to know what are the slings rated for, Travis? These slings right here have got the rating right here per OSHA like you're required to have. They are rated in vertical at 6200, choker at 4600, and basket at 125. All right. Basket meaning you've brought this thing back up, all right, and it's being attached back to the hook in some form this way, and you're lifting in a true basket form, all right. You have two legs of a sling, all right. This is my climber here, Steven, all right. How you guys doing? There's a contract climber here in North Carolina. Oh, let's get you hooked up. You've, you forgot your strap. It's oh, easy oh. to do. And you're, yep, Go get ahead. your glasses. It's very foggy here, people, because of the humidity, so hang with us. We're not going to do anything unsafe, I promise. We're not going to let that happen, all right. Steven's a contract climber, works for CNS Tree Service as well as Skillin Tree Service out of Durham. All right, so if Mike's watching, maybe you can give Mike a hi, how you doing? Hey, Mike. He was climbing for Mike today. So what he runs, he's gonna run a doubled rope system, a moving rope system, on a zigzag. The way to attach it on this is he's simply gonna bring this up. It's gonna go through here and back down and in. All right, once you get it hooked in, he's in the ball. Is that good enough? Are we, are we ready to fly him? Absolutely not, all right? We know 
per Z133 that we're going to need a second point of attachment. All that needs to be is he can simply pass his lanyard through the throat of the hook, get your knot through there, and come back down. All right. Now he's wearing a tree motion harness. So we know with the tree motion, can't use the uppers. We've got to drop it down to the lowers here, all right, because we're going to be held in a vertical suspension. All right, we're not in a horizontal suspension. Now at this point, he would be ready to fly. All right, he'd be ready to go to work. All right, looks like he's got everything. All right, we're going to grab a saw real quick. There it is. We're keeping very green today with Husqvarna's electric saw. All right, personally, absolutely love this saw as a climber. Because we all ask that question of, how do I leg lock a saw in the tree to start it? It's hard to do. Well, here, all I got to do is push a button, and I'm started. All right, so this is the saw he's going to run today. There you go. Oh, nope, right in the steel one. There you go. Now he's hooked in, all right? At this point, we're pretty much ready to fly. We've already done our pre-hazard assessment. We've already done our job briefing, all right? Because we're flying a climber, we have to document that, though. It's not good enough just to say, eh, it's easier, we're going to fly the climber. It's not good enough. We have to have an actual reason we're going to fly him. It has to be a safe reason. The safe reason today is because this tree is wrapped in poison ivy. Just wrapped in it. I get poison ivy really bad. Steven gets poison ivy really bad. Chris doesn't want to pay for him to go to the doctor because he gets poison ivy on this job site. So we're going to fly him because it's going to be safer for our climber. Okay? There's multiple reasons you can fly a climber for that reason. But you ready to fly? Are you ready to fly? Ready. Let's go to work. All right. There's a question, Travis. Yeah, let's go over here while he gets fired up. Sure. Oh. Lazars wants to know about pre-hook inspection regarding textiles to metal. So textiles to metal is always a consideration. You want to take care of your hook, though. All right. So first thing we're looking for is a non-twisted hook. All right. We want to make sure that hook is not twisted. Ten degrees is what we're looking for. Anything more than 10 degrees, it's out of commission, all right? In the throat of the hook, we want to make sure that it's nice and smooth. We have no burrs there. Any of those burrs are going to cause issues with that, all right? So we always worry about that. It's a great question, and that really should be something that you're inspecting on a regular basis, all right? Now, because we're all on Cinecom systems here, we all can talk to each other. But if we weren't, we're going to give a little hand signal, all right? Hoist up, all right? We're going to go fly our climber, all right? I'm going to step over here and narrate what's going on while they're working. All right. So he's going up. Chris has got him. You see this tilt cab here. So as Chris is boomed up now, his cab is tilted for him, which gives him operator ability to see. All right. We discussed earlier how we're not going to use the crane to maneuver ourselves throughout the tree. The crane is merely a lifting capability. We're going to use the crane to get him to a central tie-in point and we're gonna move from there, all right? So we're slowly getting into position. We might be able to hear a little bit over here. I'm gonna walk over on this side and see if we can hear a little bit better. I know it's really loud, folks, so we're gonna give myself a block over here, all right? As Nick zoomed in on him, you're seeing he's carrying him up to a central tie-in point, all right? When he gets that tie-in point, he's gonna inspect it, of course, before he comes off the ball, all right? Gonna get that second tie-in point. He's gonna attach his system, come off the ball, and he's going to get down and start setting some slings. All right. Again, we talked about it. We're going to set three slings on this. Anybody want to take a stab at why we're setting three slings? Anybody want to write in real quick on why we're going to use three? Give you a second. All right, got it. Rope bag coming down. Rope bag is down. We're going to reposition a little bit. It's kind of hard to see from over here. All right. At this point, the climber has removed his lanyard from the hook. The crane has stopped movement. All right. So therefore, now the crane is no longer lifting him. It is holding him in position. He can come off that lanyard. That lanyard, that second tie-in point, is just for that. It's just for when being flown by the crane. All right. So Steven's going to go ahead and get his system set. He's going to lanyard into the branch. And at that point, once he's lanyarded in, he'll come off of the crane ball and go to position and let the crane maneuver the slings and all that to where he needs to be at. Sorry if you hear me drink some water there, folks. It's a little parched. All right. So now he's getting his high point. He's inspecting it, looking through our canopy, the operator, myself, 
the climber, we're all talking. We're all in the same boat here to make sure we're all understanding what's going on. All right. That's what the beauty of these Sinas helmets are. Because we have these Sinas, all right, we're able to communicate. All right? You actually can get your helmet now directly with the Sina already attached. All right? You don't have to put it on yourself, which can somewhat be a pain. All right? You actually can order the helmet with it attached. It's plumbed correctly. There's no issue. And then if you have an issue, you can just call up Trees and say, hey, this helmet is Carry you. Great customer service that we've always known with Tree Stuff. All right? Crane operator is going to move away. All right. Oh, I'm getting some signal. Yep, here we go. All right. Crane operator is going to move away. He's getting the ball out of the way there. All right. And let the climber work. All right. No need for that crane ball to stay right there at the climber. He's off the ball at this point. All right. Our climber is starting to maneuver through the tree here. Get in place. Real beauty of a machine here with this swing cab. I can't talk how awesome it is. All right. Okay. All right. Got it. All right, sorry about that, folks. We're having a little bit of audio there from me getting too close to the truck because I get excited about cranes. So I'm going to stand over here and stay in my lane. All right, Steven's getting out to his first attachment point. All right, I'm going to put my laser up here, not in Steven's eye, but crane operator is dropping the balls down. Here comes the ball down, and we're going to put the slings on, all right? First sling's going to go where the blue light's at. Then we're going to move over here and put the second sling here. Then we're going to drop down and put the third sling here. All right. Reason being is we want to stabilize this load. We're working directly over a barn. All right. Well, we're going to want to keep this stabilized at all times. We don't want to have a lot of induced swing. All right. We're going to perform a V-cut to control the butt as it comes out. We're going to lift and swing it out and land it. All right. But in order to do that, we have to have three points of attachment on this branch. All right. This crane operator is working. You get near him. All right. Sometimes, you know, with these cranes, you have that moment where the load line is not quite where you need it to be. All right. So the operator is going to do the best he can to get that ball as close as he can to the climber so the climber doesn't work too hard. Because we are using a crane for efficiency here too. That's one of the big reasons why we use cranes is because of efficiency. All right. We're going to get our slings set. Make sure the slings are set nice and tensioned. All right. All right. Crane operator are talking about how much weight we're going to pre-tension this for. All right. We both agree that four is a good, good pre-tension. And when I say pre-tension, what we're doing there is we're actually going to go ahead and pull tension on our load line before we make our cut. Just two things. One, it allows the piece to hover when we cut it so it doesn't come out. Also, what it's going to allow is deflection of boom. So when a boom is flat out, I'm going to step right here to the camera so you can see my hand. When the boom is flat out like this and the load line's hanging here, when it comes under load, it's going to bend a little bit. Well, that bend is going to cause the load to shift away from the crane. That can be a big problem when you start shifting that load away from the crane because you now are increasing your radius. All right? When you increase that radius, you decrease your capabilities of the crane. So you really want to take that deflection out before you make your pick. All right? We are unlike every other industry that deals with cranes. They don't have that problem because if they go to pick something up and it's not good, they put it right back down. Where here, if we don't get the deflection right to start with, we have issues. So we're going to pre-tension. The way we pre-tension our crane is we don't just pull up on the hoist line. We're actually going to boom up a little bit. We're going to boom up and get the tip pulled back just a little bit till we get the right amount of tension. We talked about we're going to pre-tension 4,000 pounds. All right, that's our pre-tension load on this piece. All right, we, we are, based on our math, we're figuring this piece is going to weigh roughly about 4,500 pounds. All right, so therefore, by giving us 4,000, that gives us enough. The piece isn't going to move when we cut it. It's going to stay in place. All right, but it's not going to sit down on our climber saw either. All right, that's the big thing. Can you kill the crane? Not yet. Can you kill the crane noise? Like... Yeah, we can in a second. All right. We also can go over here where it's a little quieter. We're not going to have that problem. All right. I understand this is a lot of noise right now. We're going to have to kind of get through that. All right. Our climber now has set his first, and now he's starting to move out to set his blue. All right. The blue is the longer of the slings. All right. So we want that on the end. All right. Yep, right there is where we're going to put it. It's a great spot. We confirm that that's good. All right. and that's really going to let it stabilize that piece when we make that pick. It's not going to allow that piece to move and rotate on us. All right. Okay. 
So what he's done here is he's put a half hitch up top. He's come down the branch a little bit, and that's where he's going to make his attachment, all right? Looks like he might be tying a cow hitch. It's kind of hard to tell from this range. I believe it might be a cow hitch. Getting confirmation that it is. It is. So he has cow hitched at this point. Off his cow hitch, he's gone ahead and gone up and put his half turn in, all right? He's going to reposition himself. We're going to move a little bit so I can get confirmation that slings are in the right spot, all right? Things look good to me so far, all right? I am I look good with that. Looks like climber's good with that at this point. Right. We've got three slings attached. All right, and we're gonna move on down to make our cut, okay? Once our climber's in place for our cut, crane operator and climber will coordinate that. All right, it's a coordinated move. The cutter can't start cutting until the crane operator is ready. The crane operator can't picking until the cutter is ready, all right? So it's gotta be coordination. This cannot be a simple, do it whenever I want to. Climber's gonna reposition his line a little bit here, do a little bit of line maintenance and a little bit of management. Because clearly, you know, we wanna make sure the line's gonna be in a good place for our climber while he's working. Right. So we're just gonna let him do that. Here comes his tail. On the backside of this barn here, we have a mulch pile. We are completely clear of our mulch pile, so we have no hazards below us. All right. Climber's also gonna position himself that he's not gonna be under the load when it's cut. So he wants to have an area of refuge. All right. So when he makes his first cut, he can move and position himself to a place where he has refuge from the pick. All right. The best way to do that is simply in how you make your V. All right. You obviously, we're going to cut a V. So if this is my branch that we're taking off, the first part of the cut of the V is going to be on this side. It's going to be on our compression side. All right. The second cut of the V is going to be on the tension side. All right. So I make my compression side V cut, position myself out of the way, reach over, and finish my cut off that way. Right. Climber's completely off the crane at this point. The crane is only suspending the load. All right, the climber's on a separate tie-in point. Right. Let me get confirmation from my operator. As you can tell my operator enjoys the lap of luxury with his neck piece on. All right. That benefits him when you're sitting there all day. Are we good to make the pick? All right, whenever you guys are ready, let's make the pick. All right. We have confirmation that they're ready to make the pick. So we're gonna watch this thing go. All right. Of course, we always have that moment where we hope it goes right. I hear the electric saw running. Right. As the piece comes around, we're gonna fly it around and we're gonna take a look at the cut once it comes down. All right, we're gonna look at how it was cut. I can't see where the cutter, where he's making his cut at this point. He's blocked by the, the barn, unfortunately. So we're gonna have to watch for just movement here. All right. Unfortunately, I just, I have no visual on that. All right. All right. We've got our deflection taken out. All right. Operator's lifting up a little bit on the piece. All right. We should be finishing our cut here shortly and be on the way. Piece is starting to move. It looks like we're coming free. Get a little bit of a twist there. All right. Our piece is free. We're booming up and out. Piece is cut free and we're moving it out. All right. At this point, Nick and I are going to move. All right, Nick, we're going to go this way to get out from underneath it real quick. All right. Operator is going to swing the load. We don't want to be under that load ever. You never want anybody under the load. All right. So as it comes over, I'm visualizing it here, staying out from under my load. All right. Crane operator is coming back up. We're going to back up a little bit. All right. Now we're going to come this way. Again, I'm visualizing where my load's at at all times. All right. I'm never losing sight of my load. All right. We're swinging around and coming around, never getting underneath our load. That's the biggest thing I see that happens with chief care companies is guys want to rush in there and get underneath the load. The crane has it. That crane can hold this load all day long. All right, there's no need for you to go in there and get it. He's doing the heavy lifting. All right, we don't need that. All right, I got my grounder over here. My ground tech is ready to go to pull the slings. Don't put it down, people want to see it. All right. 
We're gonna hold it right over here. Yep. Hold on one second. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. We're gonna swing it around that side for us to see a little bit better here. I lost comms with my operator for a second. Yep. We're gonna bring it on down to me. All right. We're gonna hoist line down a little bit and we're gonna look at this cut real quick. Hold right there. All right. So what you can see here, the cut we have, we had the V, all right? This was our compression side. This was our tension side. This cut was made first, and then we followed it off with this cut. What this allows it to do, by having these two cuts sit in here, it traps the piece in. That's what we're looking for. We're really looking to trap that piece in until the operator is ready to cut this piece out. All right, I see a lot of climbers that want to use traditional notches doing crane work, and you can't do that. They're a totally separate kind of notches, all right? At this point, we're going to lay it down, and we're going to lay it down that way, all right? All right. Can we hold right there? All right. If you look up top, we've got two slings attached. Yeah. That's fine. I will spin it. We're going to spin this piece around real quick. We're going to keep on, we're going to do a full 360. Yep. Full 360. All right. Hold right there. We're just going to hold right there so you people can visualize what's going on here. All right. All right. We're going to back out of the way for a second. You can see how our slings are set. All right. Our blue sling actually comes through the canopy and back to our right side leg here. Unfortunately, these cranes. They do this. When we use our knuckle boom, we won't have this problem. All right? You can see our other ones. We've got our attachments there. All right? And you come on down. Let's go ahead and set it down. We're going to set it down the butt right here, and we're going to lay it down this way. All right? And we'll get a better look at the slings once we get on the ground. Why, he, why didn't he use a snap cut? Because our piece was coming over our barn, and a snap cut would have dynamically loaded our crane. All right? By doing a V, it stays trapped. We like to say things trapped in the V. All right? By having that V cut, it really traps it in there, so we can't get any movement side to side. All right? Though a snap cut's a great cut, it requires the crane to lift the piece off. All right? All right, so can you see our ground here? Our ground tech is getting our slings off, so we can reset to the next pick. All right. While he does that, you see the first slings in place. One thing I find is a great efficient way to do this is don't worry about having to pull all these slings out. Just untie them. Let the crane pull the slings out. He's got the power. So once we get them all untied, you can see we have a half hitch here. We half hitched up here. We came down, we terminated down here, all right? That gave us that good angle of the sling we're looking for. Also gives a good hard point attachment. All right. We can pan this over here and we can leave that sitting right there and our crane can pull that out. All right. But now who wants to see the knuckle boom work? Who wants to see the mech saw do what the mech saw does? We like the heart side of things, life. I like the thumbs up. We had the thumbs up now. Now I get to do with you guys and the heart people. All right. So now we're going to move over. I'm getting ready to find out. Hold on a second. I got to go over here. My center died, folks. Hold on. Where are we at on weight? 43. We came in at 4,300 pounds. So we were pretty close. We put 4,000 on pretension. Came in at 43. Hey, Chris, I want you to run your mech saw now. Can you leave this here and just run your mech saw for me? That'd be great, thank you. All right. Our slings have come out, they're flying away, and we're gonna come over here to the heart side of life that you people like so much, and we're gonna watch our mech saw work, all right?
Oh, wow. I think I swallowed a gnat. Yeah. Got me. We got anybody from North Carolina watching right now? Any North Carolina people? Who else we got? I wonder what the furthest... So what? The wow button for North Oh, Carolina. the wow button for North Carolina. The wow face, right? But where's the furthest point? Did maybe Doug from Hawaii is watching? I know he said he was going to. Doug's see, watching. Doug's watching. Hey, Doug, good to see you, buddy. All right. Who else we got watching? Let's get some shout-outs going while we can change cranes real quick. We got a little bit of downtime. We're gonna shut the first machine down, and we're gonna move over to the second machine. We're gonna go use the claw. Everybody remember that from Toy Story? The claw! That's what this is right here. It's a claw in all of its glory. This is a Mechanol 280, all right? Meaning it's got a 28 inch bar down here, all right? This is its grapple size. It not only flexes up, rotates side to side as well, all right? This crane here, we've got three upper jib extensions. And we have three lower jib extensions. We have six total jib extensions plus one manual section. We have our manual pulled out about, about two feet, and that allows us to still retain the full 1320 to run this head. Now remember, we got to deduct for that mechanol head, all right? So we can't pick a 4,300 pound piece like we could with this piece, all right? Oh, sorry, I'm wrong camera, folks. I, there's so many cameras here. I don't know who to look at. Is this, it's here, I don't know. I almost feel like it's an infomercial at some point, you know? Shake weighty style. All right, all you, buddy. Get up there and make some. Now I want you to show the people, I gotta talk. Chris was asking me if he wants me to run his machine. As much as I want to run his machine, I'll get distracted and playing with the machine and talk. I'll forget about all y'all. You don't want me to forget about all y'all. All right, we're going to demonstrate what this thing can do real quick. Let's grab. I'm going to step out of the way because there goes the saw. Now, that's what it does when it does right there. Before you fly, do come over here real quick, Chris. We're gonna take a look at this controller, all right? As you can see here, it's a paddle style controller, all right? Each one of these has got different functions on it for the different heads of the, of the machine. You have different jib arms. All these have different settings, okay? Over here is how we control our actual mech head. As you can see, we have tilt up, tilt down, and saw. But these are double actuated controls. We have to hold a lever to actuate the hydraulics while giving it the electronic signal. So the learning curve's a little higher here. Oh, how do this? Chris has been doing it a while. Chris runs the machine every day, all right? He's one of the owners of CNS Tree Service, so he loves this machine. Chris, show us what it can do, buddy. My laser go. There it is. I get my laser back. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna start by dismantling this part of the tree here first. And we're gonna dismantle it down until we can't get any lower than here. Once we can't get any lower, we're gonna hold and we're gonna let our climber make the cut instead of the mechanol. That's the beauty of these machines. You have the ability to hold and cut or you have the ability to hold while a climber cuts. All right, so it's multiple capable. You can see as he's extending out here, it's one section at a time. Unlike the Alltech that extended all the sections at one time, this one does one a section at a time, all right? So we're in the lower jib now. Lower jib, we've got fully extended, all right? And I'd say that lower jib angle, we've probably got a 45 degree angle at full extension. We're good for 1,600 pounds, all right? Now, again, we added it up for the math though, right? So we got 1,600 pounds, all right? Minus 900 means we're good for a 700 pound pick. That's the max pick we can do is a 700 pound pick, all right? Unlike this crane here that can do the 4,300 pound pick, 
we can only do a 700 pound pick. All right, we're gonna fly it all the way around and land it back on our brush pile. That way none of us are underneath it at any point. As you can see, that saw head has to rotate out of the way a little bit. All right, just because of natural rigging, it has to rotate. Now we can drop it, we can bomb it out from there if we wanted to. All right, but we're gonna bring it down in a nice controlled manner. All right. Once he gets to the point he goes to do, he's gonna open up. As you can see, he's dropping the lower extensions now. We got so many cameras here, folks. We gotta move around cameras a lot. All right, now we're going back to the next pick. With a seasoned operator, with a seasoned operator, you really can efficiency, your, increase your efficiency on job sites with this machine. But does this machine replace a climber? Absolutely not, as you're gonna see here in a little while. We still have to have a climber doing what a climber does. So for us climbers in the world like myself, don't think you're out of a job just because these machines are on the market. You're not, all right? The biggest issue we're seeing with these machines now is people are taking big weight they're holding it above and they're letting it rotate down. All right. I'm gonna slide this camera right. There we go. So what there, Chris? Yeah, we're gonna take that piece off right there. All right. Now he has to control the angle a little bit to get it right. All right. He'll grab it. He's gonna pre-tension his pick just like he did on his other crane. So you always want to pre-tension just enough. And then we're gonna make our cut. I'm gonna rotate you just a little bit so the crowd, the crowd wants to watch your fingers do the, do the dancing. Right. We'll tickle the ivories over here. All right. So we've got it locked in place. Everything looks good. He's pre-tensioned. Right. Oh, got to wipe the foot on my eyes here real quick. Woo! It is. I was hoping by later in the day it got, the better it would get. Huh? Let's see if we got going on here. What's going on with the saw head? He's cutting below. Okay, he's cutting below? Okay. So now, what Chris is demonstrating is the capability to hold and not cut. So we've held the piece. All right. And now we're going to pick the whole piece up and rotate, okay? All right. When we look at here, we can turn a little bit, Chris. You can see on the front of this piece here, we have an indicator of load rating. All right, how much we're able for. With that, we only got up to 80%. That's all we got up to its, max, to its capabilities with this configuration. It was 80% of the load. All right. So with 80% of 80, the computer tells us where we're at. Unlike the load line crane, that gives us exactly, this only gives us percentages, all right? We got a few more picks to make. Do those, the white oak next. There we go. We're good to go. We're gonna drop this piece right on down. And touchdown. And from here, he can just open up and drop it if he wanted to. But he's gonna set it down nice and gentle. The hands of an experienced operator right there. The good news is we're building a great bonfire pile for later at this point. We're gonna get some marshmallows out and roast some marshmallows. All right, next we're actually going to be working over top where Carson's op center is at to take out a white oak branch. The owner of the barn here wants this white oak branch gone, so we're going to take care of it for him. Are you guys not sharing this right now? How are you not sharing live crane removal operations? I don't understand. If I was at home, I'd made popcorn, I'd have cast it up on my big screen, I'd be sharing this with my friends. I might be inviting my neighbors over. I'd be watching this. Huh? Yeah. Remember, I want hearts, 
for this beast right here, the thumbs up for the beauty over here that did 4,300 pounds. All right, big difference in weights of what we can do. All right. So now we're going to go over this piece over here where Carson's at. Carson doesn't know we're doing this pick above him though right now, so this might freak him out just a little bit because he has no idea. All right. So if he comes running out here real quick, we'll know why. So you see, we've angled the saw head where we need to angle it. Spin this guy around here like so. All right. He's going to thread the needle to get that in there like we need to be. Oh, we got it with one fork and we missed it with the other. Ah, I hate when that happens. Now, a lot of questions I get asked sometimes about operator licensing is boom truck. Boom truck operator's license is the same if you're operating a knuckle boom or if you're operating a stick boom. The test in the class is the same. The difference is, is the credential you carry. You will either have an articulating boom or a fixed boom, all right, non-articulating controls. All right? He's got the piece. He's holding it good. We're going to pick it up and we're going to swing it out of our way. It gets a little dicey when you start getting in tighter areas though, all right? As we're going to see, as we get closer and closer to the main stem of the white oak, it's going to get closer. All right? We are good to go. Got the piece. We have maneuvered it, and we're out of the way, all right? Flying up and over. How many people we got watching now, Nick? Did we up our numbers any? 275, oh, we can do better than that. I think Taylor Hamill only had like 300. I can't beat Taylor? Oh. Maybe, maybe you that's what you should do. Start tagging random people. All right, Tag, tag Taylor. Yeah, Christian, Michael Schultz, and, and a friend. Taylor and a friend, okay. All right, just tag people. Get them to come watch. I mean, where else are you gonna watch an actual knuckle boom mech saw working live? I mean, anything can happen here. Hold on one time, get some director commentary here. We gotta get the rest of that one off first. All right. We gotta finish this wide oak and then we're gonna go back over to our sweet gum, okay? Though it may look like we're directly over where Carson's op center is at, believe it or not, we're good and clear. Oh, we're going back to the sweet gum now. Right. Let's see what Chris is going to get next. So with our knuckle boom, of course, we're going to start at the very top and we're going to work our way down. Being very careful on certain trees, certain species, especially like tulip poplar that are very brittle, when you grab them, they're going to have a tendency to want to break. Okay, so we have to be very careful when we grab them. Two more picks. And then we got other things. hour and a half. Any questions? So one thing that Knuckle Boom Chris has here, he also has the cable to be seated in the operator seat. This really actually comes in handy when you have to have that elevated platform to look at what you're picking at. All right. Oh, we lost one. Like I said, this is live. Anything can happen. All right, downside the knuckle booms, folks. That's why I don't hurt them. I do the thumbs up because with a load line crane, that doesn't happen. All right, but 
We're tree workers, we're gonna take it in stride and we're gonna make the best of it. When you get done with that pick, just bring it down, the head. Yep. We're gonna show tie-in. All right, one thing I heard a lot of people say is, oh, well, can you only double rope off a crane? No, you can single rope off a crane, and there's ways to do that. We're gonna talk about those ways to do that right here. All right? You actually can tie in to a knuckle boom as well. All right? Using the ANSI tie-in, you can tie into a knuckle boom, and we're gonna do that. All right? Chris is gonna bring our head over right here in front of me. He'll just bring that head right here for me, Chris. Let's put it right here. All the way down. Yeah. Keep on coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. All the way down. Down, 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 down. Rotate up for me. There we go. Rotate down. Hold on one second. We're going to turn the stroke off. Go ahead. And bring it on down for me. All right. You can shut it off. All right. We're going to kill some of the noise so we can hear a little bit better now. All right. So we made some picks. We showed the difference in the cranes, but what about different ways to tie in? All right. Now we can hear better. We're back to our same ANSI crane tying kit. All right. Hmm. Well, how are we going to attach this to here? We don't have the load line like we did on the load line crane. All right. So there's different ways we can attach this. One option is simply to girth around the extension here. Okay. And you can girth this right to the extension, like so. All right, totally acceptable. Downside is if you want to keep the head in place, see where now that all this is laying, it's laying right where your head's at, all right? So you really want to watch setting up like this because eventually this is going to slide down. And now we have all of this together as one. I don't recommend this, all right? If you're going to use a knuckle boom and leave the mech head on with a climber, let's do something different, all right? Let's get a shackle, and we're going to shackle this actually directly into this hole here, okay? We can put a shackle on here and we can attach this piece in directly, all right? That gives us the ability to now, when we are not hanging in a perfectly vertical position like we are now, this moves us away from our head. We gain that two feet of separation, all right? But how are we gonna do a second tie-in, all right? Now we're back to that same problem, second attachment point. Well, we treat this as the hook, okay? Otherwise, you have a hook in place somewhere else. You can have a hook in place here instead of the mech head. And you go through that the same way. If you have a mech head on, you can use this as your lanyard through here. You're two feet away, not a problem to do that. Feed your lanyard through here and leaves it out of the way. But you always gotta make sure you have that second tie-in. All right, unfortunately we had a crane, uh, we had a crane, a climber died this year off a crane. And he had a single tie-in point. They went to hoist him up. When they hoisted him up, his, we, we believe that maybe his bridge might've failed and he fell and he died and he left us. You know, we're killing 100 more, 100 or so tree operators every year in this industry. And it's for literally simply laziness. I'm not gonna beat around the bush about it. It's something that I have a huge heart for. We lose workers constantly because of laziness. Simple thing as a second tie-in point, takes five seconds to do. Would have had somebody here with us today that isn't. All right, so don't be lazy. You know, if it's in the standard, the Z133, it's there for a reason. We don't just build that document just for fun. We don't get together every six months in Baltimore and sit around and find out ways to make your life harder. All right, I'm all part of that committee. I'm one of the task chairs for the rigging and felling section. Get involved. We got a meeting coming up on October 10th in Baltimore. Anybody in the industry is welcome to come. It's open to anybody. You have insight. It is your document. So get involved, all right? We're always looking for new people to get involved. But I hear we got some questions right now. Um, can that saw get pinched and what happens if it does? It absolutely can get pinched. It can get pinched. The question, it can get pinched. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, can this saw on the mech head get pinched? And if it does get pinched, what do you do now? Absolutely can get pinched. Anybody who's done tree work long enough knows you can get a saw pinched just about anywhere. All right. The downside is once this saw activates, the order to close the saw back, you may have to open the, the mouth of the jaws up. You've got this piece locked in there with the jaws. The saw operates below the jaws. All right? Some of the troubleshooting might require hydraulic flow to open these jaws up. It's a very dangerous situation. 
all right? The best solution, if you can't problem solve it from the ground with the controller and just simply maneuvering back and forth without opening the jaws up, is possibly use a climber. Have a climber go up and cut below where the saw is attached at, where this whole head's on the branch at. All right, this actually happened to me recently. I was in Alaska doing some work, and this exact thing happened. We got to the top of a spruce tree. We made our cut. The saw got bound up. We couldn't get it unbound. It was a bad day. I ended up spiking up the tree and cutting a foot and a half below where the saw had bit into the wood but hadn't cut all the way through it yet. And that's how we ended up getting it off. And it was a very dangerous operation, but it was the only way to solve the problem. Another one of the downsides of these machines is once it's bit into that wood and you can't retract the saw blade back, it's there. You know, this isn't like a 201 that you can unbolt the bar from and leave the bar in the tree. All right. We got another question. Uh, can you address um, using SRT climbing during crane work? Absolutely. Crane? Most certainly. So a lot of us are climbing SRT. I'm one of them. All right. And a lot of people feel that you can only double rope or moving rope system off a crane. That's not true. All right, there's lots of different ways to do that. We're gonna look at our crane tying kit here. All right, I'm gonna keep my sunglasses off or my safety glasses off right now, folks. It's so humid, they keep fogging up and I can't see you. So I understand that. We're not currently doing actual work. So if you can allow me to, I'm gonna leave them off. If anybody has an objection to that, please give me a thumbs down and I'll put them back on. All right, an angry face. An or an angry face. You, if you had a scolding face, you could give me that. All right, but it is so humid here. I literally feel like I'm swimming. All right, so what we can do is we can come through here and go, I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna run and grab a climbing line real quick. Just give me two seconds. Right back. Yep, coming in the backside. All right, and I'm back. All right. So if we can imagine this nice saluting branches rope here, we're gonna single rope on this. All right, anybody who's not doing saluting branches, first question is why are you not doing it? All right, definitely get involved. All right, so say we're gonna single line. All right, imagine the zigzag is not in place. All right, we're gonna come up. Two different ways we can do this. One, we can come through and we can simply leave us a nice long tail, you know, maybe give you a 30 foot tail and you could actually tie in a butterfly here, okay? Some people like rope on rope. Some people want to do a Texas tug using a pinto or using a ring. I prefer just to tie it in, all right? Come back around our side here. We're gonna trace this back on through real quick. Yeah, it's a lot of tail to work with, but it's not that big a deal. All right, we're gonna pull that nice and tight. The key to tying this is you have to come in the opposite way this comes in. All right, so I'm gonna find my end here. We're gonna come in opposite direction, all right? and exit back out in the same direction. Pull of our tail through. Come here. Caught the wrong one there. All right. Now, see there, got our butterfly, all right? So we can actually cinch this up. That jam's in place, and I can single line now. So if I, oh. Almost lost the camera there, Carson. Watch out there. All right, get mad at me. So if I've single lined in, I've got my retrieval side here. All right, once I'm in place, I can DC my wrench or my runner or my unison or a Kimbo or whatever device you're running. And I can simply retrieve this back to me all the way back, all right? I can untie my knot and I can retrieve this out of the system. That's one option, all right? Another option, it's a simple jammer knot, okay? You can tie a simple jammer on the backside and retrieve it that way. All right. You can use a ring, clip a ring system in. There's all different ways to do it. Very similar like you would a redirect for SRT systems. You can do that on your crane tie-in. I personally prefer to double rope in a crane, all right? It's just my personal preference. I really have no great reason other than the fact that's where I live, all right? I'm one of those individuals where I single up and I double down 99% of the time. I use a Texas tug and use a, and use a coattail and I double down, all right? So that's just my preference. If you're a single SRT guy, like maybe Doug out of Hawaii is, you might only want to SRT off a crane and that's okay too. But you're gonna use the same type of attachment you would for a redirect, a jam or not, maybe a ring and ring friction saver type system, 
on here, it's the same exact thing. Nothing changes. All right. Somebody earlier when there was the when we had the climber up on the stick crane. Yeah. Um, and you're gonna have to restate all this. Said, I'll do my best. They said uh, somebody asked why the climber didn't stay tied in until the slings were tied. Well, because per ANSI. So the question was. I always forget to do that. The question was when our climber was riding our load line up into the sweet gum, why the climber didn't stay attached to the ball until after the slings were set. All right? The reason being is the Z133 is very clear about hoisting of a climber. All right? Climbers are to be hoisted into the tree. The crane is not there to position the climber. The crane is there not to move the climber throughout the tree. The crane is there to lift him from one place to the canopy of the tree. Now, the climber could have stayed attached to the ball as long as the crane wasn't moving and maneuvered throughout the tree to set the slings if he needed to. But it's an efficiency thing for me. I want to get off the crane ball as fast as I can. I want to get onto the tree. I want the crane to carry me to a good tie-in point, and then I want to start moving throughout the tree because it's efficient. If I'm waiting every single time for that crane to come back to me, to position me for my next pick, it's costing time. And anytime you're using cranes, time is money. So for me, and for the Z133, it's always best to get off the crane ball as soon as you can onto a suitable tie-in. This crane is not operating as an aerial lift for you. All right, that's not its purpose. Its purpose is to fly you up there because there's a hazard for some reason. It's a safer option than you spiking the tree. All right, so that is why we do that. All right, you use two tie-in points because you're being hoisted, and we go up from there. All right, another question. Any more questions, folks? Am I? Am I? Oh yes, I like more questions. There are no more. Oh, there are no more questions. Well, that's kind of like sad face for me. Like, I feel like you guys are just kind of hanging out there. I mean, maybe you're home. Maybe Gary Thacker's watching me right now. Hey, buddy, what's up? All right. So hopefully you guys are enjoying this. I know it's been really hot and humid. We've actually gone a lot faster, partly because of me, because I am so hot. I did production work today and this. I'm tired. I talked a little fast, folks, and I'm sorry about that. But by all means, if you get nothing out of this class other than get more information, get more knowledge, all right? That's what this is all about. We're all about sharing knowledge here, all right? Get more knowledge. This book right here has a wealth of information in it on everything that you could possibly need to know about cranes, all right? One more last call for questions and we'll see what we can get. All right. One, let's do some more questions real quick. And then we're going to do a little bit of quiz time to get you ready for your CEUs, all right? Because I want you all to be prepared when it comes time for CEUs. All right. For time for questions, and then I'll go check them. All right. More questions, and while you guys are writing your questions in, I'm going to go over a few questions for the CEUs. All right, so you guys can be ready for that. All right. It is extremely hot. All right. So let's think about some of the crane signals you're going to need to know. Okay. Because crane signals are a big deal. They're uniform signals. They're written by ASME B30.5, accepted by ANSI. All right? And you need to know those signals. One thing that everybody says is, oh, every crane's required to have the signal chart on the crane at all times. And that's not true. OSHA is very clear that it requires you to have the hand signals on the job site, not on the crane. Okay? You don't have to have them on your crane. They just have to be on your job site. Now, of course, if they're mounted to your crane, that makes things easier, all right? One of the common hand signals, of course, is hoist up. We have hoist down, all right? You got to extend the boom, retract the boom, all right? Boom up, boom down, all right? Stop, and emergency stop. Swing, le swing right, swing left. Make sure when you're giving the swing signals, you're giving them towards the operator's perspective. That really comes in handy when you're using Senos. All right, or any type of comms device. You always want to give direction from the operator's perspective. All right, so if you're looking at the tree and the operator, it's reversed for you. Another great way to really make your operator happy is to count movements down. So if I'm swinging the ball overhead, I'm going to count them down and say, swing left, three, two, one, stop. What that allows the crane operator to do is to go ahead and start slowing their turn down. Because if you just say stop, well, they're mid-turn, they're going to stop and come back, all right? So really counting them down really makes for a much smoother operation. Now, these hand signals we just went over are for load line cranes. We don't really have a set of individual hand signals for knuckle booms. 
Because if I gave extend out, well, do I want to extend out my lower jib? Do I want to stay out my upper jib? What am I extending out? All right, so it's a little bit different and we haven't quite handled that yet, but we're working on that in the industry. Right? Hopefully you had some time to put some more questions out there. All right? You have some questions at the end of this thing for your CEUs. All right? Again, they come right out of here. So we're all there for those. All right? Do we have a question, Nick? Yep. Wonderful. Well, let's get, we're done with that. I was waiting for you to come back with questions. We're going to do some questions and we're going to call it a day and stop sweating to death out here. All right. How do you approach a tree that is unsafe to tie into? Who's the question from, Carson? Rowan Tree Care. All right, Rowan Tree Care. Well, that's a really difficult situation. All right. So the question is you know, we get here and the, the tree is just way too dead to tie into it all. All right. So you have two options to start with. First of all, can you get a lift in place? Can you work out of the lift with a crane on site? If that works, then you obviously can work right out of the lift with a crane on site. If that's not an option, is there a site set up for two cranes? One crane for a climber, one crane for the material. And then last but not least, if all else fails and you have nothing else, you have to stay attached to the crane while doing the picks. All right? That's an extremely dangerous situation. When you do that, you have to take your chart, you derate your chart by 50%. So if my chart says I'm good for 2,000, if I'm gonna have a climber set a sling, make a snap cut, and then come down and stay attached while we're manipulating, I've gotta be half of what my chart says. The best option, if you can do it, set your sling, make your snap cut, and get out of the tree altogether. Get out, get away, let the operator lift the piece off when you're nowhere near it. I'd have to ask Chris, I don't know. I know gross on this one is 6,800, but I don't know this one. I'll find out for you if you want me real quick. Just give me one second. Hey Chris, what's your gross vehicle weight on your tree mech? Uh, empty 47. Empty 47. Empty is 47,000. 68,000. 48,000. 68,000, 47,000. 47,000, empty weight. Now, he has log standards on here, so he can carry material with him as well. All right, so he does have the capability to load a mini skid up here, he could load a stump grinder up here, he could load logs after the end of the day. But remember folks, he's gonna go pick up a stump grinder to put on his truck or a mini skid like a Vermeer to put on his truck. He has to be a certified operator at that point because he's no longer lifting organic material. All right, so again, make sure if you're an operator out there, get with your company, all right? It is also an OSHA fine if your company doesn't make training available to you as an operator, it's actually neglect, all right? And you don't wanna get hit with that fine, that's a big one. All right. Benoit Boudreaux. All right, Benoit. French Canadian guy. Uh, Benoit Boudreau uh, wants to know um, when it isn't suitable to use the V cut. Well, that's a really tough question, Benoit, because the V cut is one of those things that you can use 90% of the time. But there's going to come times where the V cut's not going to work. One of the biggest times is when you're on a branch that's completely flat out. We have a lot of big oaks around here that have completely flat branches. You wouldn't want to use a V cut here. All right, because it's not going to give you anything. What you do want to do is what we call a shelf cut. All right, you can cut in straight down a little bit and then come in completely flat underneath this way here, allowing the piece to sit on a shelf. Or you can cut a notch on the top side with an undercut on a flat. And that allows the operator to stay in the piece upright while leaving the butt sitting on a shelf. So the shelf cut's really good on flat pieces where a V cut's not going to work. Another great cut, especially for the bottom, is what's called a sawdust cut where you take the chainsaw and use the top side of the chainsaw bar and you work your way around the stump, shoving chainsaw dust into the kerf of the cut so the piece sits on top of the chainsaw dust and doesn't pinch the bar. It's a great cut at the end. Uh, who's the question from? James Baker wants to know if you short jack one side of the crane, what's it do to the rating on the other side of the crane? And I, I hear people say all the time, I don't need my outriggers out all the way on this side because I'm working off of that side. Absolutely. So whenever we're short jacking, what we call mid-span setups. All right. As I said earlier, this crane has the ability to mid-span. So does this machine here. You lose your capabilities. And I understand the fallacy is, well, if I'm working off that side and I short jack this side, what does it matter? I still should have full capabilities. But you don't. You have mid-span capabilities. You have the least possible capabilities. So if you short jack one side but not the other side, you need to be using your chart for the short span side, even though you're working off full side on that. And I understand there's a little bit kind of black magic stuff there, but it has to do with the way the truck is designed to be built in its first, that loadout. 
because that's great if you're picking here, but as you're swinging around, you're transferring load weight throughout the chassis, throughout the outriggers. Again, it's not as big of an issue with stabilized machines like a knuckle boom, but when we get on outrigger machines like a load line crane, it becomes a massive issue. All right, so you really wanna make sure if you're gonna go mid-span at any point, you are now using your mid-span short, even if you have full on your pick side. What kind of, who is it? Uh, Benoit Boudreaux would like to know um, what kind of gear, say it again. What kind of gear do you use to balance lateral picks other than maybe say the Chisholm crane sling or something that we So one of the today? tools that are, we don't use a lot in the tree industry, but the construction industry has used for years is a thing called a spreader bar or an equalizer bar. And what this is, is a bar that allows you to increase and decrease lateral sizes. So what you do is you run from your crane, your crane ball down to your equalizer bar and from there you run straight slings all the way down. All right. What that allows, and I believe there's a picture here in this book on this, what that allows is you to pick that way in a vertical configuration. I'll see if I can find it really quick. If I can't, then you can always Google it online and look or equalizer bars. I'm not going to probably find it because I'm looking, I need it right now. So that's usually the way this works. Yeah, it's in his manual. You can find it there or you can Google it's it online. An I -beam. It's kind of like an I-beam, yes. It's an I-beam with two eyeballs in it. It's similar, but it can go in and out. All right. Travis, there's not any more time left that's, on the internet. They're going to shut great. us down. Um, I have a couple of things uh, that I'd like to plug really quick. Absolutely. Um, I, when I get this many people on the internet watching, I feel obligated to tell them. Uh, first Fallen Families Fund. So we started a charity last year. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, we use it to give grants to people that were injured or families of people that were killed in the tree industry. You can go to fallenfamiliesfund.org uh, and check that out. It's a fully fund, uh, fledged uh, 5013C charity, like the whole deal. With That's the wonderful. Government. Yep, it's awesome. Really is. Any money that we collect through fundraisers and we're selling t-shirts at events and stuff, 100% of donations or collections goes to grants. Um, None of that money goes to pay administrative fees. It doesn't pay me or anything like that. Um, and then all of our administrative fees are funded by Cheryl. Um, so, like, the whole thing's taken care of. It's really cool. You can check it out at fallenfamiliesfund.org. Or if you, unfortunately, were injured or you know somebody that was injured, please refer them to the website. There's an application there. Um, and they can apply and, uh, you know, get a, get a grant. We've already paid grants out. Um, it, it's happening. It's it's wonderful. Yeah, so we're really uh, excited to, to be able to do that. And that's really how we take care of our own in this industry. You know, we need to take after each other. Yep. This is one of the ways we do it. So uh, really happy to be a part of that. Something a little more exciting, uh, Capture the Canopy. It's gonna uh oh be, It's going to be this October. Uh, there's not going to be any spectators allowed. It's going to be a really small group of people. Uh, we are going to broadcast day one. Uh, it's a 10-person, 1v1, head-to-head competition. Invitation only. We're going to bring 10 of the best. They're going to go this is going to be better than The Bachelor. It's going to be really Way cool. better. So day one, we're going to broadcast live, just like this, from three or four cameras. We're going to have Jake, our announcer, who did the draft. Oh, yeah. The Jambo stuff. He's going to be calling these games like a sportscaster. Only one stage. We're not operating on multiple game zones. Everything's in one place. We're going to show all the action on the camera. It's going to be really, really cool. So day one, we're going to seed everybody and rank them. Day two, we're going to shut the live stream off. So... You guys at home, you're going to have to wait. But we're going to film it with a full crew, and we're going to turn it into nine or ten weekly episodes where we eliminate one climber each week to find the king or queen of the oh, canopy. It's going to be yeah. so successful. So capture the Canopy 2018. Uh, it's going to be in October. Um, we're thinking the last weekend, the 27th and 28th of October. Uh, you'll be able to watch it only from your home. Uh, so get a watch party together. Uh, it's going to be really, really exciting. Uh, we've put a ton of thought into that. Like uh, pay-per-view, we don't have to pay for it. It's great. Yeah, you're going to be there. I you're will be there. One of our officials. I will be there. Uh, I've invited James Kilpatrick. If you know him, tag him. If you don't know him, tag him on Facebook. You can find him. He's just like a normal person. He has a regular Facebook account. Send him a message and say, dude, go to America and be in Capture the Canopy. He's the world's best climber. We want him to come. 
So if you know James, tag him. If you don't know him, tag him. You can find him on Facebook, James Kilpatrick. Please send him a message. Tree's gonna love that. I did. I looked him up. I looked him up and sent him a message, and I was like, "Hi, James. It's Nick from Tree Stuff. Will you come to America?" So please, yes, uh, let's encourage James to come. Uh, or any of the world champions, Mark. We'd love to have Mark come. If you know Mark Chisholm, tag him. If you don't know Mark Chisholm, tag him. Go to Tree Buzz, tell him to come and compete. Uh, we'd love to have those two guys. So um, that's it, Travis. Thank you thank for you. doing this. Thank uh, you to CNS Tree Service for letting us do our yard. Uh, we don't pay CNS Tree Service nope. either. This is all free for you guys. Yeah, this is what so we do this for. Thank you to all these folks. Uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you to Carson Royer. Um, Absolutely. Right man. Thank you to Jake Miller. Uh, who's our new uh, media guy back at the shop. He helped plan a bunch of this. Really appreciate uh, everything that Jake did, that Carson did, and uh, that you and CNS Tree. Uh, please check out fallenfamiliesfund.org and uh, remember treestuff.com. Thanks for watching.